Hello. My name is Andrew Moore, the marketing manager for the NI Science Festival. This evening, we're delighted to welcome back for a second time Dr. Rachel Clark. She talks about her brilliant new book, Breathtaking Inside the NHS During a Time of Pandemic. Chairing this event is Belfast based author Jan Carson. Enjoy. Hello, folks, and welcome to this Northern Ireland Science Festival in conversation with Dr. Rachel Clark. You are very, very welcome. We're delighted that you could join us today. I have been looking forward to this conversation for quite some time since this book popped through my letterbox. Um, this is breathtaking. It's Rachel's third book and we're going to be in conversation having a chat about it today um, from our living rooms. We really wish we could be there with you in person and we were delighted to have Rachel with us at the Science Festival last year. Um, she's come back again so she obviously had a, a good time last year um, and I'm really looking forward to chatting to her today. But let me introduce Rachel to you before we begin. Dr. Rachel Clark is a palliative care doctor and writer who lives in Oxfordshire with her husband and two children. Her last book, The Sunday Times number three bestseller, Dear Life, was shortlisted for the 2020 Costa Book Awards and was longlisted for the 2020 Billy Gifford Prize. It's based on her work in a hospice and explores love, loss, grief, dying, and what matters at the end of life. Um, and Rachel was with us earlier last year or earlier in the year um, talking about Dear Life. Um, today, she's going to be talking about her new book, Breathtaking, Inside the NHS in a Time of Pandemic. Um, it is literally caught off the press, just published, um, and I think this is Rachel's first event talking about it, so we're delighted to have that, her with us today. It aims to capture what it was really like inside the NHS for patients, staff and families during the first wave of COVID-19. Um, Rachel has written for numerous eminent publications, which I'm not going to list them all. Um, she's a very accomplished journalist as well um, and has appeared on all sorts of TV programmes and radio shows. Her first book, The Sunday Times Bestselling, Your Life in My Hands, depicted life for a junior doctor on the NHS frontline. Um, there is a lot to talk about this morning, so I'm going to get out of the way. Um, my name is Jan Carson and I'm going to be your host today for the next hour or so. Um, first of all, welcome Rachel. Congratulations on the book. Um, and my first question is, how are you? Where are you? And what's life like for you right at the minute? Well, thanks so much. And uh, it is really lovely to be back, but boy, I wish I was in Belfast and preferably in a bar in Belfast. That's what I really could do with right now. And I imagine most people watching feel the same. Um, I think I am like pretty much everybody in the NHS right now, running on empty. Uh, this second wave is so ferocious and virulent and we were all so exhausted at the end of the first wave. I think the NHS hasn't really recovered from last year to suddenly be plunged into uh, death tolls, which as we know are, are, are even higher than they were first time round. The numbers of patients in hospital are getting on for double what they were first time round. Uh, over 4,000 people now in intensive care across the country. All of that is, is hard going. Um, so it's funny because you would imagine having written a book, you'd be really excited about today is actually publication day, the day that we're speaking. And honestly, it's hard even to focus on that simply because at the moment, everything's so overwhelming and, and every single colleague, everyone I work with, the doctors, the nurses, the porters, everybody is just pouring all they've got into looking after patients, whether those are COVID patients or, or non-COVID patients because things are so overwhelmed at the moment and you just grit your teeth and you go in every day and you do the best job you can. And it's hard to look up from that at the moment. It's all consuming. There's a lot of life happening very fast at the minute for everyone and particularly for you guys that are on the front line. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about this third book it's it's quite different from the, the books that have come before maybe how it came to be and you know was it obvious that you wanted to write about the pandemic right from the start 
it wasn't at all. Uh, I, I think I had a, a dreadful sense of foreboding in the weeks leading up to the first lockdown back in March, as many doctors did, because we could see the writing was on the wall. We were all following what was happening in, in mm. Italy back then. And Italy, if you remember, was a few weeks ahead of us. So, so they were having these exponentially rising cases and then exponentially ri rising deaths. And we could see that in Lombardy and in Northern Italy, hospitals there were being overwhelmed. They were running out of oxygen. They were running out of ventilators at a time when we still hadn't locked down in Britain. And, you know, things like the Cheltenham races were still going ahead where hundreds of thousands of people gathered over the course of a week. And that sense of dread turned into a, a month, the month of April, where suddenly all of us were, were thrown into pandemic medicine. Um, and it was like nothing I had ever experienced in all my years as a doctor. And I think for me, the, the stress of that meant that very quickly I had really terrible insomnia. I, I couldn't sleep at night. It was, I couldn't really talk to my husband about it because I think it's really hard to understand if you're not there in the hospital. Yeah. So I used to come downstairs and just sit at the kitchen table bashing away on my laptop. And it wasn't a book, it was more a kind of therapy really. I just had to get it out somehow. And slowly but surely, when that dreadful first waves started to abate and we started to have breathing space, I think I almost then found it more traumatic in a way than during the, the peak because at least then we had the focus of our patients. So you just focused on one patient and then the other. And then when it abated, you had time to, to process or not process what it had been truly like. And I started to talk to colleagues and I realized we were all in the same boat and that there was this public narrative about what had happened and what was happening that was so divorced from the reality behind those closed hospital doors. And I suddenly realized I had this wealth of testimony and it might be um, imperfect and subjective and non-authoritative, but it was real and it was raw and it was my experience. And I think in a sense, the, the journalist in me felt I have to document this. And the doctor in me felt I must do this because I want people to know because this disease is real and deadly and I don't think people really understand what it's been like. And so there was almost a sort of public health impetus behind me wanting to write the book because I, I wanted people to see and feel what we had felt in order to understand how, how terribly seriously we on the front line take this virus. Mm. It's really interesting to me because there's been a lot of talk this week about Michael Winterbottom's TV show he's going to make about the pandemic, which we're still in the midst of. Um, and I know you've written about some of the pressures of being a junior doctor on the NHS. And there's a there is a there's an urgency about that because there are issues that still need to be addressed. But did this feel like a different book in terms of urgency in the sense that we're still, you know, you're writing about things that are still happening? Um, yeah, exactly. I, I, I mean, I wrote, so it, so I wrote the book sort of in the summer lull, really, uh, be, between the two waves. And I wrote it very fast and furiously in a, in a kind of insomniac frenzy. And I didn't, I wasn't able to think, I wasn't able to craft it or, or dwell on the language. It, it almost poured out in quite an unmediated way. Um, and I, as I wrote it, I, I knew there was a risk that winter would be bad. Respiratory viruses tend to surge in winter conditions and we all feared there would be a resurgence, but never in a thousand years did I think we would be not only back in the same conditions as before, but actually in conditions that are so much worse this second time round for all kinds of reasons. I, I, I it astonishes me that 
the government has allowed us to end up here again. So we have just passed a day where over 1800 new deaths from COVID were registered in 24 hours. That is double the entire death toll in the whole pandemic in the whole of Australia. That many lives have been lost in, in one day in Britain. And I, I, I'm just astonished and dismayed and heartbroken that we could be in this, this situation again. And so in a sense, the urgency with which I kind of poured out that story of the first wave, I think perhaps in a sense has been validated. It is urgent. Yeah. It is literally a matter of life and death because here we are again. First time round in a pandemic, of course, mistakes are going to be made. We're all human. Prime ministers are human, just like any one of us. We're going to get things wrong. That's forgivable. But what's unforgivable is failing to learn from our mistakes and working out how to do things differently and better second time round. And, and I hope if in a tiny way the book contributes to that public discussion, then maybe it's doing something good. Um, Rachel, I wanted to ask you as well, before we move into the, the nuts and bolts of some of the amazing people that we meet in the book, um, just about the writing process itself. I'm a writer and I am just in awe of how you manage to produce this in the middle of a pandemic, working with children, all the responsibilities. And I know you, you said, you know, you had insomnia and you wrote at night. But can you tell me a little bit about that process of, of writing something so substantial so quickly? It's incredibly impressive. Well, I think I've realised now, having written, this is the third book I've written, I've realised that there's one thing that unites all three of them, and that is a, a, a sense to me that they were necessary. I was burning to write them. I had to write them. They were a kind of force bubbling away and simmering in my chest and I had to get it out. And I think probably I'm not able to write in any other way. Um, I have to write from the heart. I have to believe it's necessary to articulate whatever it is I'm trying to say. And in a way that gives the writing process its own momentum. And for me, I think my writing is, is odd because it is absolutely embedded in my life as a doctor. So to my mind, my writing is an extension of what I try to do day to day with patients. It's about trying to communicate with, with people on a, a larger scale in a way that I hope will protect people or keep them safe or highlight important issues or somehow contribute in a tiny way to public health. It's, it's all about communicating a message that is a bit like health promotion, you know, um, telling patients to be careful of sunlight and check their skin or check their breasts for breast lumps. It's, it's, it's the same thing. And I know that that might sound a bit glib and inaccurate, but it definitely for me all comes from the same place. And I think also as an NHS doctor, I have this terrifying work ethic because you have to, because we're so understaffed and we're so busy every day at work that I can't allow myself the luxury of writer's block. That's just not an option if you're an NHS doctor. And it's a luxury for me squeezing in a little fraction of time to write. And if I have 20 minutes between the school run and cooking the kids dinner, then it's a, a luxury for me to use those 20 minutes to try and set something down on the page. So I think I probably have a very odd writing process, but it all pours out and then I go back over and over and over again, sort of whittling away with my, my verbal scalpel and trying to, to slice it into shape. Um, yeah, so that's how I do it. <laughs> actually strangely recognizable when you say talk about the luxury of having writing time it does feel like a wee gift to yourself sometimes just to get your thoughts in a line and um, I guess I, I also wanted to say from the other side of things that I you know have had family members and loved ones with COVID I lost my first um, really dear friend two weeks ago 
and to be able to see this from the other side, I find it desperately reassuring to know this is what, you know, this was what my friend might have experienced from the NHS care that she got. Um, and because a lot of us aren't able to go into hospitals and see what our loved ones and family members are experiencing. So I find it really reassuring from that perspective and hope that they're all made in people as nice as you and your colleagues that you describe here. Yes, absolutely. And I'm so sorry to hear that because it this is the reality of COVID, isn't it? You, you've lost your best friend. There's probably no one in the country who's untouched by loss in some shape or form in this pandemic. And that was definitely my other um, source of, of impetus and momentum. I I knew from very early on, I think particularly because I'm a palliative care doctor and I know what really matters at the bedside at the end of life, I realized we all did that there was something uniquely cruel about this disease, this virus in that it cleaved us from one another at the very times when we needed the support of our loved ones. So, so how how devastating that coronavirus is spread through the very means through which we communicate with each other, our touch, our speech, literally speaking can infect the person with whom you're in dialogue. And so all of a sudden, not only did we have huge numbers of people succumbing to the virus in hospital, but we also had this absolutely inhuman set of circumstances where literally every single person in hospital never saw a human face. Every face was masked. Everybody was a pair of eyes above a mask. And if you were unfortunate enough to come into hospital and die from this disease, you literally never saw a human face again in your life. And I was so aware of that, we all were, and it, it was so obvious that we needed to do everything in our power to communicate love and care and attention at the bedside and I think that is one thing that the NHS does absolutely beautifully everybody cares about that and we knew that in the absence of loved ones without family members there holding vigil it was it was up to us to provide the love and I tried to do it in two directions communicating that to patients but also when I picked up the phone and I spoke to someone in tears at the end of the phone I tried to communicate to them that the love was there I would tell them little things that their their loved one had said I would find out what mattered to them and all, all kinds of little ways we use to communicate that love so sometimes family members will write a letter to a loved one and we will sit and read it out at the bedside or they'll tell us their favorite piece of music and we'll play it in the room and all those little ways of trying to help patients feel absolutely that they matter and they're cared for is as precious as oxygen in some ways in this virus it's 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 everything and I suppose it felt essential to me to try and communicate to the public that despite the horrors, despite how bleak and awful this is, know this, know this for a fact, we are always doing that for patients. You might not see us, you might not be there with us inside the hospital, but we will never ever stop doing our utmost to help patients feel loved and, and, and not alone. I wonder, there's a, a wee passage in, in the book where you talk about this very tangible way of making sure that people feel connected to their loved ones. I wonder if you wouldn't mind reading that for us now. It'd be lovely to hear a little excerpt from the book. Yeah, I, I'd love to. Um, th this is uh, th this is um, this is about a, a, a lady who, uh, a resident of Banbury, the, the town where my hospital is based in Oxfordshire. And she was desperate to do something to help. She was locked down herself at home. And she tried to think of a way of helping patients who were 
themselves locked down inside the hospital. Um, so I'll read this little extract and then I'll tell you what we did with it. In a small terraced house on the edge of Banbury sits a woman on a sofa beside a ball of red wool, her fingers darting as swiftly and deftly as a chime of wrens. Like many of us now in the thick of the pandemic, Sandra is frightened. Everything's been upended. A trip to the supermarket entails queuing for hours, and once inside all the flour and yeast will be gone, as though the country intends to bake its way out of the crisis. Dangers lurk unseen in the world beyond her doorstep. One false move, one reckless inhalation, and the virus could be there in your lungs, proliferating. Sandra paces and frets and disinfects surfaces as she tries to keep her anxieties at bay. Each day, the news announces a world more frightening than the day before. We shiver with dread and try to manage the fear of losing those we love or of them losing us. Lockdown is life interrupted. One day, Sandra finds herself rummaging in her wool basket, unsure of what she intends to find. It's her 60th birthday, and as she considers her good fortune to have arrived at this age, she feels propelled to do something for others. She thinks of her local hospital, the Horton General, and all that the patients and staff must be going through there. An idea begins to form. She pulls out a ball, the colour of blood, drawn to the richness of crimson. She takes her crochet hook in one hand, settles down by the window and begins methodically, almost rhythmically to braid a miniature of the one thing she's certain matters more than anything in these times of tumult and loss. In the hour it takes her to craft the tiny symbol, her mind flutters less distractingly and her breathing slows. She looks down at the splash of redness nestled in her palms and for the first time that morning she smiles. This little woolen metaphor, a heart that spans no more than an inch, has both calmed her nerves and inspired a manifesto for action. Dear everyone in the NHS, Sandra writes later that day, thank you with all my hearts for everything you are doing to keep us safe and alive so that when we meet up with our loved ones once more, no one is missing. You are our NHS angels, love and blessings, Sandra. Sandra's decided she will work and work until she's stuffed a jiffy bag with 60 crocheted hearts, one for each year of her life, and deliver them to the Horton. When her package is opened by the hospital receptionist, she immediately picks up her phone and calls Mandy Kitchen. If anyone would know where Sandra's gifts are needed most, it's a specialist palliative care nurse. And so one day, a bag of hearts appears on the desk of my pierced, peroxided partner in crime, who immediately conceives a plan of brilliance. And Mandy is an extraordinary nurse who I work with in the hospital, incredible palliative care nurse. And she figured out a way of using these little crocheted hearts to try and connect families symbolically who couldn't be there in person and she, we would give one little heart to a patient who was very unwell and we would give the other to a family member so they could take it away with them and even if they were away from the bedside they knew that this little symbol connect them connected them and it sounds very small but but sometimes to families it meant everything and it really helped to know that just I think the staff had recognised the importance of love and, and the seriousness of the absence of loved ones at the bedside and that we were trying to overcome that with the hearts. And I just think it's extraordinary that Sandra, in order to help her own anxieties, came up with this beautiful, beautiful idea to help people who were more vulnerable than, than her. That's, that's what proliferated in that in our pandemic and it's continuing to proliferate now kindness and goodness and community spirit and it's something to hold on to 
I know that you you close the book with the line, the, the worst of times has brought forth our best. And we've seen so, so much of that with gestures like, you know, Sandra's little hearts and kindness and generosity. Um, have you seen that for the most part or is it is it tempered sometimes with frustration because we've also seen some of the worst of people, you know, the, the naysayers and the deniers and the complainers, you know, has it been hard as a someone who works for the NHS to, you know, to see what the general public, how they've responded to this? Well, in the first wave, that really palpable sense of gratitude from the wider public really meant everything to us it was it 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 helped because it was it was so frightening in those early days we didn't have vaccines we didn't have treatments it was a totally new disease we didn't know if our ppe was going to protect us or not we were so frightened of infecting our families and knowing that the public was behind us with all those rainbows and hearts and and the claps every thursday evening oh that meant so much it, it just it really gave you a little bit of steel as you pulled on your PPE in the morning. This time round in this second wave, it is sometimes very hard because there, there is, a very, I think, a very small but very vocal, quite, quite toxic minority who deny COVID. They say it's all false positives. It's not true. Hospitals are empty. And I'm, I'm someone who is pretty active on social media in, in the evenings. I'm trying to get messages out there that I think are important. And, and the price of doing that is I get trolled and I get abused sometimes and, and threatened sometimes online. I've literally been threatened with rape, with death. And that's simply for the crime of saying COVID is serious. Please stay, please stay inside. Uh, and that's, hard that's that's really hard but I think myself and my colleagues who have been through the same we're not going to be silenced because we believe it's important and we know we're telling the truth and we're only ever trying to speak out for the very best of reasons which is we we literally don't want to be holding your hand in intensive care we we we, we want to be treating as few people as possible and and that's just that's just so important. It's so so frustrating for us on the outside watching that happening and going, these people are already working as hard as human beings possibly can and we should be supporting rather than undermining what they're doing. Oh. Um, I want to come back again to, to the hearts and to Sandra and to particularly to, to the people in this book because once I got finished, um, there, there's lots of really really quite shocking statistics in here there's you know lots of hard information but it was the people's stories that stayed with me both your wonderful colleagues and the folks that you were with at the at the end of their life um, and what really struck me is the emphasis on the whole person so we see your team finding out little um little bits about what kind of music people like what sports they're into what football teams they support to make sure that experience is holistic. Can you talk to me a little bit about, you know, when you're right down to the knuckle with healthcare provision and it'd be so easy to deliver kind of a bare bones service, why is it important to keep holding on to the, the person and value in the person in the midst of it? It's just everything. It's, it's the absolute heart of good medicine, I believe. Uh, you know, we, we doctors could be, technicians and the technical sides of medicine are of course so important and just miraculous to, to be able to carry out brain surgery or transplant somebody's heart or, or, or literally cure someone's someone who's blind restore their their sight that's all remarkable but it's technical and medicine is about healing uh, we all go into it because we want to help people who are suffering and we want to try and take their suffering away, minimize their suffering, help them live as, as, as fully as they're able to and on their own terms. And so that means the relationships between doctor and patient or nurse and patient or any of the other innumerable members of, a, a, of the team in the hospital because it, it's so much bigger than doctors and nurses. Um, that's absolutely vital because if you 
if you put yourself in the shoes of a patient, going into hospital for most of us is frightening, it's intimidating, it's depersonalizing, you often have the things that build your sense of self and dignity stripped away, you get put into a gown, you get a barcode put round your um, your, your wrist and people start doing things to you and sticking things into you, whether it's a needle or an endoscope or a cervical speculum or whatever it might be, all of these ways that are a, 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 an affront, I think, to our sense of self and dignity. And so if you work in healthcare, you have this, this real privilege of uh, working with people at, at their most vulnerable, they may be at their most frightened and insecure, and you have the privilege of trying to help them through those moments. And it really doesn't take very much at all to help a patient feel like they're not alone and that there's someone there who's got their back literally by stopping to chat for 10 seconds or squeezing a hand or telling someone that you're really sorry they have to go through this but you're going to make sure that they don't do it alone that that's all you have to do and I think in palliative medicine we have a very very strong ethos that that is incredibly important and come what may you mustn't um, you mustn't lose sight of that because if you do then suddenly your hospital experience is going to be inhumane. Um, and even in COVID, even in a pandemic, and in some ways this is, this has been and is at the moment a bit like battlefield medicine. It's that overwhelming. I think we, we really fight tooth and nail to preserve that at all costs. We know how important that is. And it is not fluffy being kind, it's not easy it's not an afterthought, it takes real steel and tenacity to be kind in incredibly difficult circumstances. But that, if anything, defines the essence of the NHS, I, I really think that's it. I love as well that you talked about um, almost kind of creating people space for people to be themselves. Um, you know, my own experiences of hospitals have always been about a little bit of a loss of autonomy where you become just a patient rather than all of the, the depth and breadth of your own personality. Um, and I, I also I love that you have talked about the whole team of your colleagues, that it's not just doctors and nurses. And I had a great privilege of being writer in residence in the Royal Hospital last year here in Belfast. And it was one of the huge things that struck me from that experience that the kindness and the care was coming from everyone, from the lady who serves the cappuccino and the, the canteen to the porters and the, you know, the, the folks that are helping in the car parks and everything. It, it's a huge team effort. Um, and I wonder if you might talk a little bit, because for most of us, our, our glimpses of, of what goes on in a hospital or a healthcare setting, it's either a one-off experience or a rare experience, or like me watching Casualty on a Saturday night. Could you give us a little bit of a behind the scenes glimpse of, for the last year or so, what has actually been the hardest thing for you personally? Maybe something that we wouldn't know as non-medical people, what has been really difficult about this year? So strangely, the actual medicine of COVID is easy in the sense that uh, normally pre-COVID patients would arrive in the hospital and anything and everything could be wrong with them. But now at, at the peak of um, this second wave, the vast majority of patients are coming in with the same symptoms, the same signs, the same disease, the same treatment protocol. And it's all very simple in the sense that we're quite limited in what we can do. We only have a couple of treatments, really. We can give people steroids and oxygen and antibiotics and even intensive care where somebody goes on to a, a ventilator that breathes for them and um, every bit of their physiology is, is monitored. Even intensive care is, is nothing more than a way of buying some time to try and 
enable the patient to recover from COVID while all of the machinery is supporting the functions of their organs. So everything strangely is, is relatively simple in a, in a medical sense. The, the really difficult thing isn't the medicine, it is the communication um, and particularly the communication with families. You, you can, I, I, I think, you can manage the, the dying in a way, it's traumatic, but we know how to help people be pain-free and free from fear and relaxed at the end of life. We, we know which drugs to give, we know how to support people, but it doesn't matter how many times you pick up the phone and break the news, to a, a, a wife, a husband, a mother, a father who is there perhaps completely by themselves because they're in a vulnerable group, so they're self-isolating at home. It doesn't matter how many times you do that, every time you're, you're just destroying a, that human being on the end of the phone and you have to, you can't give false optimism, you can't promise something that isn't true, you have to tell the truth and so repeatedly you are the person who is causing someone's life to fall apart when you say I'm so sorry they're not going to survive would you like to come in we don't think they can survive for very long and if you're a human being I, I don't think it's possible to do that without it taking a little bit of your soul mm. um, and it does that every time uh, it it never gets easy, you become used to it, you learn how to do it more and more skillfully, and you learn what you need to do to protect yourself cumulatively from the cost of that, but that's not the same as saying it's easy. And sometimes, and I know I speak for so many of my colleagues when I say this, we will literally leave at the end of a shift and I will pull over at the side of the road and I will just weep this has happened many times and I'm, I'm weeping because the suffering that I have been very intimately involved with, I've been up close to this tiny number of patients and this tiny number of relatives, I know that it's replicated in every hospital up and down the country. It's like this, just this awful nationwide wave of wrongness and I'm too small to fix it, I can't fix it. I, I know that it's there everywhere. And you just feel as though your heart is breaking because of that, but you cry and you go home and you probably have an extremely large glass of wine or two. And then you do the same thing the next day. And actually the thing that makes it bearable is knowing because people show you in so many different ways that this thing that takes so much and costs so much from you is the most important thing, the only thing that matters in life. I think that kindness is stronger and harder and more enduring than anything else. And COVID will not take that away from us. Yeah, and I mean the the book talks a little bit about your you know your role shifting slightly and your guiding and walking some junior staff members through the, this process for the first time as they learn how to do this. You've been doing it for many many years, um, and I know it never gets any easier. But are there are there coping mechanisms? I mean, we, we all joke about chocolate and wine, but there, you know, there has to be something beyond that. And, you know, I, I'm so struck in, in the book, one of the, the, the parts that really affected me the most was your relationship with your daughter. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you come home and you're a mummy as well. And you've, you know, you have a daughter who's anxious at certain points in the book. So you don't just switch off when you come home, you have other responsibilities as well. How, how do you how do you juggle all of that? How are you sitting here this morning looking wonderful and very awake and functional? Um, 
it's incredibly impressive. I've put a lot of makeup on <laughs> and I may, today's a day off and I may have a sneaky power nap and in it very shortly. So <laughs> it's all fake. Um, I think you tell yourself that these are extraordinary times and no matter what you're feeling, there are so many people who are going through something worse and all you can do is your little bit. And my little bit is caring for patients. My twin sister is a teacher and her little bit day after day after day is pouring energy and enthusiasm and kindness and positivity through her laptop into the rooms of all the children that she teaches. And, and I think that is equally, if not far more remarkable than anything I do. I think every teacher deserves an OBE for, for doing this day after day after day. Uh, and I think that the, you know, the, 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 the people I pick up my, my groceries from in Sainsbury's at the end of the day, who are there sometimes being abused themselves because they ask a shopper to put on a mask, they're remarkable, everyone's remarkable. Uh, and I think I say to myself, whatever, however hard it is, and it is hard at times, we're all doing this for each other. And I think at the worst of times, you really do see people rising to their best. And what I am lucky enough to witness every day in the hospital is this extraordinary kindness and strength from everybody. I mean, sometimes a patient with COVID who may not survive their illness says to me, how are you? Are you all right today, Dr. Rachel? And, and I just think to myself, how is, how, how can a human being do that? And, and they do over and over again, or, or a relative who knows they may lose the love of their life, the, the, the man they've been married to for 40 years will say, I'm really worried about you and the nurses. I don't want you to catch this. Are you looking after yourselves? And again, you just think to yourself that, that there's that um, line from Hamlet, what a piece of work is a man intended negatively. But I think of that positively, what a piece of work is a man? How can people be so generous and so selfless? And that's what carries you through. And that's why you do it. That's the only reason um, you've quoted the what a piece of work is a man there and I'm going to flip it the other way to the more negative sense I think we do have to talk about this I'd, I'd love to talk for a whole hour about the selflessness and the bravery of the NHS and the frontline workers and the, the people who've made sacrifices but we've also seen what a piece of work a man is the other way from the government and it has they certainly haven't covered themselves in glory over the last year. We've had PPE shortages and lack of preparedness. And can you talk a little bit about your frustration there? I know you, um, I've been following you on, on social media and you've been quite vocal about that. And possibly if you think there is a possibility for change or what we can do to, to give them a bit of a kick in the right direction, maybe. <laughs> and just to clarify, kick is not actually beating up Boris Johnson, is it? No, it's, no, kiss. Just an encouragement, just a kick up the backside. Nothing more, nothing more. No, no, no kick. On my back. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, to say I'm frustrated would be a wild understatement. I and every doctor I know and every nurse I know and every porter and every paramedic and every midwife and all of us, we are burning with rage. We are absolutely consumed with rage. And that is not because 
we care about party politics. There are some things that are so much more important than whether a politician is Labour or Conservative or any other party. I don't care about that. I care about patients and people and vulnerable people. And there are I mentioned earlier that that not learning from mistakes is unforgivable. That is absolutely right. The other thing that is absolutely unforgivable in a politician, a, a leader in the midst of a pandemic is failing to be honest and candid and open and transparent with the population that you lead. So you're gonna get things wrong. Everyone's going to get things wrong. Everyone's going to make mistakes. Okay, we understand that. We're all grown ups. we're not stupid, but to lie about what's happening, to pretend that things are not as they seem, that is unforgivable. So for example, we know that nearly 900 health and care uh, professionals have died since March of COVID. And we know that in the early days, thousands and thousands of staff did not have the right PPE. We had awful footage and photos of nurses putting on bin bags because they didn't even have plastic aprons. And at the same time, we had Matt Hancock, the health secretary or Boris Johnson standing up and saying, we've provided 2 billion pieces of PPE and the NHS is protected and it, and it just wasn't true. Um, I think one of the most egregious examples of dishonesty was when after nearly 30,000 residents of care homes died from COVID, the health secretary stood up on national television and said he had thrown a protective ring around those vulnerable residents. Again, it simply wasn't true. They were abandoned to COVID. There was no plan for them. There was no support for them. There was all this talk of protecting them, but in reality, nothing happened. And I think that is what makes us burn with rage. The, the, the very worst example of this is the prime minister refusing to level with the public. Just before Christmas, his scientific advisors were saying, you have to lock down, please lock down. But he didn't want for whatever reason to give the public that unpalatable message. So he kept saying, um, we will have a five day period of mixing over Christmas. And even at the 11th hour, he still allowed mixing for, for 24 hours on Christmas day. That was a failure of, of leadership in the most profound sense. What he should have done is made the difficult but right decision to lock the country down sooner. And, and the cost of him not doing that is probably tens of thousands of deaths that needn't have happened. And I can't bear that. That is more painful to me than going to work every day and caring for people who are dying. I, I can't bear the thought that people have died and are still dying in Britain because we have a prime minister who's pathologically incapable of making difficult decisions and of being honest and leveling with the public. Um, so in answer to your question about how do we do things differently, it's really, really simple. Politicians need to talk to the public in the same way that doctors do. If, if you have a diagnosis of cancer and I, as your doctor, am not honest about that and what that means for you, then I'm absolutely failing as a doctor. I'm not worth, I'm not worth my medical degree if I'm incapable of being honest with people. In a pandemic, politicians have as much power, more power than doctors over people's lives and deaths, and they have to be honest because otherwise you lose trust you lose faith, people stop obeying the rules because they don't believe you anymore, and then you're in a disastrous situation. So, so that's what needs to happen. It's really simple, just be honest. Yeah, and I, it must be so frustrating because the parallel is so clear cut with every single day, you have to make difficult decisions and tell people things they don't want to hear. And yet, you know, you're calling as a doctor, holds you to that you must be truthful with your patients and their families I'm sure it must be so so frustrating 
And um, one of the other frustrations that you touch upon in the book is how COVID has disproportionately um, affected different members of our communities. So, you know, it, it has been particularly cruel to the BAME population, to our elderly vulnerable, to people from lower income backgrounds. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, of what, what you've seen directly and, and possibly even, you know, what could be learned from it moving forward? Yes, it, it, this is su such an important aspect of the pandemic. In, in the early days, the, the government rhetoric was, was very much, we are all in this together. And, and I understand that, of course, we needed a collective spirit. I, I can't, I, I lost count of the times the words blitz spirit were invoked. Um, but actually, of course, in a fundamental sense, we were not ever in it together. Yes, anyone could theoretically catch the virus and theoretically die from it, but that didn't mean our, our risks of doing so were equal. And as with so many diseases and so many types of ill health, there's this profound socioeconomic gradient to who catches COVID and who dies from COVID. If you're on the breadline, if you have a very low paid job or you have very, um, uh, precarious conditions of work, then you may not even get a COVID test because you know that you can't afford to self-isolate for two weeks. Whereas if you have a, a, a well-paid middle-class job that enables you to work from home where you have your laptop and you have your Wi-Fi and all of those things, you're automatically protected because you are able to sequester yourself away from the virus and it's easy to forget that so many thousands of people in Britain do not have any of those luxuries. Um, so what we have seen as so often in health is particular groups are essentially being marginalised and suffering more through Covid and, and um, socioeconomically that's hugely important. The BAME situation is also incredibly worrying so, so, so very early on we started to realize that the sickest patients the patients who were filling up our ICUs very often came from a non-white background and no one understood why that was the case but if you realize that a particular group in society is at particular risk then obviously you need to make particular efforts to ensure that group is protected. And so often in so many ways that that hasn't happened. It either hasn't happened at all or it hasn't happened quickly enough. So, so even now, we the vaccines are now being rolled out and they have been for a few weeks. Uh, but the, the NHS is not gathering ethnic data on who is getting their vaccine and how protected they are um, how, how protected people are in, in different ethnic groups, even though we know that certain ethnic groups are at increased risk of dying from COVID. So there's, there's all these ways in which I think a lot of the right noises have been uttered. People have talked the talk about equality and egalitarianism and all of us being in it together. But, but of course, actions always speak louder than words. And in terms of action, um, the, the, the government and to some degree the NHS as well has been lacking in lots of ways. Again, I think that's something, in a way that's positive. We can learn from that, we can do better, we can figure out all, all the things that might help these vul particularly vulnerable groups be better protected. And the important thing is ensuring we do that. Of course, our knowledge is incomplete in an evolving pandemic, but we need to proactively gather it and we need to proactively then act on what we find. Um, I'm coming to a close now and I know audience members, if they were here, would want to ask this. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask what, what you think is going to happen next. I know you're not you don't have a prophetic voice into what the next year looks like, but is the vaccine going to be the great hope that you know it, it, Boris Johnson wants it to be? And um, do do you have any predictions for what we can expect over the next wee while? Well, 
even though conditions are so tough at the moment and, and we're speaking right at the peak of the second wave now, I am enormously and genuinely optimistic. I think it is absolutely superhuman and magnificent that in less than a year, we've got not one but two vaccines licensed that are incredibly safe and incredibly effective. That is a complete game changer. And um, we are managing at least to roll out first doses of those vaccines to an incredibly speedy degree. And that is wonderful. That is going to save lives. The most important thing I think is for, and I desperately hope the government will do this, it's for the government to be looking ahead beyond January, February 2021 into the medium and longer term future to properly COVID proof society in ways that haven't happened so far. So our test and tracing infrastructure was lamentably bad for most of 2020. We have got to improve that, we've got to get that right. And we've got to address the fact that for so many people, isolating at home is impossible. So we know that less than a third of people who should be self-isolating actually do so. And to a large part, that's probably because they can't afford to. So, so that's easy to fix. There are ways of fixing that. You can give people financial support to self-isolate. And I think if all of that happens, if we genuinely work hard at having functional testing, tracing and isolating in conjunction with vaccines, which we know are superbly effective, then we have everything to look forward to. And I, I don't want to raise my hopes and start to put time scales on that. I don't think things will be very different by Easter, for instance. I think we'll still be locked down. In many ways, I hope we will be. But pushing on to the summer, I see no reason why life couldn't be very, very different. And sustainably so there's everything to work towards right now and i and i really feel optimistic that we can and we should get it right and maybe i'm going to be in a pub in belfast before the year is out <laughs> i will buy you a pint rachel you are fun. on yeah. <laughs> a pint of guinness <laughs> Um, listen, I think I'm going to leave it there because that's a wonderfully optimistic, hopeful place to leave it. Um, I'm just going to show you this. Um, Sarah from the Science Festival popped the book through my, my door with this little note that says, bring some tissues. <laughs> and I feel like I need my tissues now after chatting to you for, for the last hour. Thank you so much for giving us your time. It's been incredibly gracious of you and also for sharing so much of yourself. Um, there's a lot of you in this book. You're an incredibly professional, um, you know, you, you've been doing this for a long time, but you're also so human and such a, a, a real, real honest, normal person that we can all relate to. So thank you for putting all of yourself into this book and being generous in that way. And um, if you've enjoyed this, I can absolutely recommend the book. Um, it's called Breathtaking. It is out today so um you, you will be one of the, the first people to read it if you go tramping down to, to get it straight away and um, our um our festival bookshop is no alibis um, and they will have plenty of them in stock and the next time rachel's in belfast which will not be too long we hope she will be signing them for us as well so um, it's all, all I have to say is thank you for spending the last hour with us. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something. Um, and I hope it has given you a fresh appreciation of what the NHS has done over the last year or so. Um, thank you, Rachel. My real pleasure. Thank you, Jan. <laughs>